Um, thank you, Olivia, for being here with us today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Center for Fiction just for a moment. I know you're all anxious to hear from L Olivia. But for those of you who don't know us, um, we are located in New York City, um, in Brooklyn, um, and we are located in an absolutely beautiful new building that we opened at the end of February 2019. Um, and in that building, we have a gorgeous event space, an independent bookstore, a bar, essential, I think, um, a cafe, um, and we um, have many, many programs, writing workshops, reading groups, a very, very active event series there. We also do a lot of work to support emerging writers um, by making grants and providing them with services all year long. And we also have a very active program called Kids Read, Kids Write that reaches kids in public schools in New York City in some of the most challenged neighborhoods in New York City, um, providing them with connections with writers and books to read, both in their classrooms and in their homes. Um, so we do a lot of good work. We do a lot of exciting things. We have a content rich, rich website that I encourage you all to visit um, at www.centerforfiction.org. Um, we had no idea when we opened with such energy and enthusiasm a year ago that this year the building would be dark. And so that's a little hard for us to absorb as it is for everyone. We're all working from home in the best way that we possibly can. And But our bookstore is functioning. So I want to remind you that you'll see on the bottom of your screen a little thing that says purchase funny weather. You can purchase it at any time during this. Just click and you'll be able to go right to our bookstore and buy it. And I also want to point out to you that all of Olivia's books are available in our bookstore. So not only funny whether I really want everyone watching to buy all of her books because it will help you very much to <laughs> all at one time. Um, so, um, also, if you have any questions for the Center for Fiction, if you'd like to support us, if you'd like to become a member, you can find all that information on our website at, um, at uh, the members page there. So please consider doing that. This is a very, very tough time for cultural organizations in New York City of all sizes, and we are not a large organization, and we're a literary organization, so of course we face some challenges. Um, Today, I am so pleased to be speaking with Olivia Lang, whose work I have admired so much since I first read her early nonfiction work, To the River, some years ago. Since then, she has written the extraordinary novel, Crudo, as well as two nonfiction books, The Trip to Echo Spring and The Lonely City, a book written when she was alone in New York City and which I carried with me and read and reread when I was alone and lonely for a period in Rome. She's been awarded the Wyndham Campbell Prize, the James Tate Memorial Prize, and other honors. Today, we will be mostly discussing her new collection of essays, profiles, and other pieces called Funny Weather, Art, and Emergency, published in the United States by Norton. The title comes from her column in Freeze Magazine that began in 2015, and the book is available, I'll say it again, by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen. Here's how this will go. Um, this event will last about an hour. We'll begin with a short reading by Olivia from Funny Weather, followed by a discussion and ending with virtual Q&A from all of you. So Olivia, would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. Um, it's very lovely to be here in my sitting room where I've been for the last two months. Um, but it's also just, it's amazing to be doing something with the Center for Fiction. I feel like Noreen is right. Our cult cultural institutions are at once imperiled and more important than ever um we're really going to need them in the time ahead and it's lovely to be able to do this to see how quickly people have sort of sprung into action to make what used to be physical events virtual and accessible as well in a way that physical events aren't i was supposed to be tonight speaking at the tate in london and that would have been amazing but that would have been for people who were in london and i can see from the sort of little scrolling list of names that people here are from all over the world and that feels extraordinary right now. It feels it feels amazing. Um, 
I'm going to read literally just the first four pages of this book. So it won't be very long. It'll be about five minutes. And I am going to um, put my glasses on because I can't not see. In November 2015, Jennifer Higgy at Freeze asked if I'd write a regular column for the magazine. I chose Funny Weather as the title because I was imagining weather reports sent from the road, my primary address at the time, and because I had a feeling that the political weather, already erratic, was only going to get weirder, though I by no means predicted the particular storms ahead. The first column was about the refugee crisis. Over the next four years, I wrote about many of the rapid and alarming changes that followed on its heels, from Brexit to Trump to Charlottesville, taking in the Grenfell Tower fire, racist killings by the American police, and changes in the law on sex and abortion on both sides of the Atlantic. Frankly, the news was making me crazy. It was happening at such a rate that thinking, the act of making sense, felt permanently balked. Every crisis, every catastrophe, every threat of nuclear war was instantly overridden by the next. There was no possibility of passing through coherent stages of emotion, let alone thinking about responses or alternatives. It seemed as if people were stuck in a spin cycle of terrified paranoia. What I wanted most, apart from a different timeline, was a different kind of time frame in which it might be possible both to feel and to think to process the intense emotional impact of the news and to consider how to react, perhaps even to imagine other ways of being. The stopped time of a painting, say, or the drawn out minutes and compressed years of a novel in which it's possible to see patterns and consequences that are otherwise invisible. The columns I was writing used art, from Poussin and Turner to Anna Mendieta, Wolfgang Tillmans and Philip Guston, as a way of making sense of the political situation of wringing meaning out of what were becoming increasingly troubled times. Can art do anything, especially during periods of crisis? In 1967, George Steiner wrote a famous essay in which he observed that a concentration camp commander could read Goethe and Rilke in the evening and still carry out his duties at Auschwitz in the morning, regarding this as evidence that art had failed in its highest function to humanise. But this makes art sound like a magic bullet, which should reorganize our critical and moral faculties without effort, or simultaneously obliterating free will. Empathy isn't something that happens to us when we read Dickens, it's work. What art does is provide material with which to think, new registers, new spaces. After that, friend, it's up to you. I don't think art has a duty to be beautiful or uplifting, and some of the work I'm most drawn to refuses to traffic in either of those qualities. What I care about more, and what forms the uniting interest in nearly all the essays and criticism gathered here, are the ways in which it's concerned with resistance and repair. In this, I'm emphatically informed by an essay the late critic and queer studies pioneer, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, wrote in the early 90s. Like many people, I've been puzzling over paranoid reading and reparative reading, or you're so paranoid, you probably think this essay is about you, for years, ever since my friend James first told me about it on a scorching day in the West Village. Though it's written predominantly for an academic audience, paranoid reading is about something that affects us all, which is how we make sense of the world, how we approach knowledge and uncertainty, as we are constantly doing in the course of daily lives, and particularly at times of rapid political and cultural change. Sedgwick begins by describing the paranoid approach, so common and widely practiced that we sometimes forget there are alternatives to it. A paranoid reader is concerned with gathering information, tracing links, making the hidden visible. They anticipate and are perennially defended against disaster, catastrophe, disappointment. They are always on the lookout for danger about which they can never, ever know enough. Anyone who's spent time on the internet in the past few years will recognise how it feels to be caught up in paranoid reading. During my years on Twitter, I became addicted to the ongoing certainty that the next click, the next link, would bring clarity. I believed that if I read every last conspiracy theory and thread a tweet, the reward would be illumination. I would finally be able to understand not only what was happening, but what it meant and what consequences it would have. 
but a definitive conclusion never came. I'd taken up residence in a hothouse for paranoia, a factory, manufacturing, speculation and mistrust. This, Cedric explains, is the problem with paranoia as an approach. If paranoid readings can be enlightening and grimly revelatory, they also have a tendency to loop towards dead end, tautology, recursion, to provide comprehensive evidence for hopelessness and dread, to prove what we already feared we knew. While helpful at explaining the state we're in, they're not so useful at envisaging ways out, and the end result of indulging them is often a fatal numbness. At the very end of the essay, Sedgwick briefly, tantalisingly floats the possibility of an altogether different kind of approach that isn't so much concerned with avoiding danger as with creativity and survival. A useful analogy for what she calls reparative reading is to be fundamentally more invested in finding nourishment than identifying poison. This doesn't mean being naive or undeceived, unaware of crisis or undamaged by oppression, what it does mean is being driven to find or invent something new and sustaining out of inimical environments. She suggests several artists whose work she considers reparative, among them Joseph Cornell, John Waters and Jack Smith. To this list, I would add nearly all of the artists dealt with in these pages, many of whom came from emotionally or literally impoverished backgrounds, who lived in societies that starved them of sustenance and that frequently legislated against or otherwise attempted to curtail and punish their erotic and intellectual lives. All these artists nevertheless made work that bubbles with generosity, amusement, innovation and creative rage. It is not only important but possible to find ways of tending to such motives and positionalities Sedgwick concludes in a sort of rallying cry for reparative criticism, hope, often a fracturing, even a traumatic thing to experience, is among the energies by which the reparatively positioned reader tries to organise the fragments and part objects she encounters or creates. Thank you, Thank you so much. Olivia. Olivia. I, 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 I. I reread the Sedgwick essay and was so taken by it, and, and um, especially by this notion of hers of extracting sustenance from the objects of culture, even of a culture whose uh, devout, avowed desire has been not to sustain one, um, but instead um, to um, at times seem to want to kill us. And I think that particularly in the context of the AIDS crisis and what transpired then. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, this notion of extracting sustenance, in a sense, against all odds, against the force of the political and uh, social environments that people are making art in. Yeah, absolutely. So Cedric, Cedric she's, the goddess of queer theory, really. And she wrote this essay in the early 90s, which is to say a decade into the AIDS crisis, um, an epidemic that was killing huge amounts of her friends, people in the culture and society that she lived in, the, the queer artistic community of New York and America as a whole. Um, and she was really thinking about the kind of art that it's possible to make in a hostile environment, the kind of art that you might be able to make if you feel, or if in fact you are, being despised by the culture around you, which it was extremely clear during the AIDS crisis, people were despised. Um, and she thought that that impulse was there, but more importantly, she thought that that impulse was there for artists, but also for readers, it's for us too it's for us to extract nourishment. So I think that is kind of dissolving of the boundary between the person who creates and the person who looks is really, really exciting as well. And the art of the AIDS crisis in particular is art that fights back, art that exists as a political weapon, but also art that's truly sustaining, radical, utopian and creating new possibilities. And the example that I've been giving lately is and I suspect American audiences might not be as familiar with him as British, but the artist, filmmaker and writer Derek Jarman, who was diagnosed with AIDS in the late 80s, early 90s, when 
there wasn't combination therapy, it was a death sentence. And he carried on being an activist, absolutely, he carried on writing, he carried on protesting, but at the same time, he also began to plant this extraordinary artist garden. And that to me seems like an icon of reparative art. I talk about it all the time because it remains so sustaining decades after his death and the unlikely setting of a shingle beach next to a nuclear power station. He built this unruly, fabulous, bizarre, magical garden. And that's the kind of thing that I think art is capable of doing, just setting up new terms altogether, setting up new possibilities. That word unruliness seems to me so key in your own um, attractions to artists. If there is one, there are many through lines in the artists you are attracted to or draw sustenance from, but unruliness in a sense seems um, a, a trait that they share in common and a trait in some ways um, in your own work. And I wonder if you think of it in quite that way, or if, if that is something that attracts you across the board in not only the work you see, but in the work you make. I think I am, yeah, I like unruliness. I don't like things being too tidy, or um, I, 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 I think I just said in that introduction, I, I'm not interested in art having to be beautiful, pure, uplifting. Those Those aren't virtues that I'm necessarily excited by. I'm interested in work that clarifies. I'm interested in work that makes new possibilities. And I think I am very drawn to, to a sense of um, complexity, layers, hidden things. I mean, even back when I was writing about alcoholic writers really quite a few years ago now, that sense of meanings hidden beneath meanings, complicated material, working from difficult material, the mix between personal life, say diaries and professional work and the sort of spaghetti of threads that goes on between between those different things. They draw me and it's very hard to say why. I think I am just naturally drawn to it. It feels sustaining to me. I think from a very small age, tidiness and orderliness and things that were too easily beautiful felt to me like they didn't have enough nourishment. And so I'm going instinctively, I think we all move instinctively towards the art that feels like it answers to something in us personally and politically. Mm -hmm. It reminds me very much of your your novel, Crudo, this um, <laughs> very messy book. <laughs> messy, but really profound and very moving book. But um, the technique you use of assuming the persona of Kathy Acker is so interesting to me. And I hope the audience will forgive me for talking about the novel for a moment. We are the Center for Fiction, though, so <laughs> I'm throwing it in because it's such an extraordinary work that is not, that, that is um, challenging in a certain way. I think challenging maybe for you as a writer in, in that creating that structure and assuming that personality and, and creating that mix of fragments, fact, fiction, um, and people merging into one another, etc. I wonder if you could talk about your strategies for that novel and how they relate to your aesthetics when you're looking at other art. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that novel, that's a real case in point of me getting frustrated by a sort of um, overly orderliness or a mode of proceeding that had begun to feel as if you know what you're going to get with one of my non-fiction books you're going to get me walking around a city being a bit sad that's the kind of you know talking about some dead artists that's the kind of vibe so I wanted to smash that up really I wanted to break that mold so that I couldn't repeat it myself and I was working on a non-fiction book at the time which I finally finished now but I was struggling with and part of the reason I was struggling with it was you know, the usual sort of technical things of how you build a book, but also because I was overwhelmed, neck deep really, in anxiety. It was after Trump had got in, it felt like the, the Brexit stuff was happening here. It felt like a very turbulent time. In retrospect, it was nothing, but at the time it felt very frightening. And those sort of moods really were making it very hard for me to write non-fiction from this sort of stable platform it didn't feel like a stable time so I was then I happened to be in Italy I happened to be reading after Kathy Acker by Chris Krause the amazing Kathy Acker biography 
And it talked about her working method. It talked about her as a young writer being taught by David Anton and going into libraries, being asked to go into libraries, take a book, copy it out, plagiarise it, but change to lose Lautrec or Dickens to I. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. What would happen if I started writing a memoir? What would happen if I started writing down everything that's happening to me? But instead of using I, I use Kathy Acker. Let's see. <laughs> So I set up, I mean, this was really, it was a private book. It was an experiment. I thought maybe I'd do a hundred copies and give it to my friends at the end of the summer. But I had two rules, which were I had to write every day and it had to be unedited. It had to be raw. It had to be like a little time capsule of the summer of 2017. So that freed me in ways that nonfiction never had. I could do anything. I mean, Kathy Acker as a writer is somebody who is careering around. She's hysterical. She's terrified. She has this emotional range that my books tend not to have. So it facilitated huge freedoms. It allowed me to really kind of make a fantastically enjoyable mess. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. The only book I've ever enjoyed writing. It's um, I noticed in the some of the writers you're attracted to also that sense of rage. I mean, uh, in thinking about the parallels between the pandemic we're living through now and the AIDS crisis. Um, and there are parallels, but they're also very, very different. Um, one of the things that I, I was so moved by was reading again about David when he wrote in this book, Funny Weather, and how he was, uh, his access to his sense of rage, which was um, so central to his work. And when I look at writers who I and, and you admire today, like Maggie Nelson, it's, for example, who's um, upturning things in the most interesting ways, there isn't the same kind of rage, although the circumstances seem quite as dire. <laughs> and I wonder what you make of that. Not only the physical health uh emergency we're living through worldwide but the political emergency we're living through um not only here but in europe as well yeah no i think that's true i mean i don't think anyone ever has been able to do rage quite as powerfully as david wonorovich i think he is the master of rage this is david this is a painting of david wonorovich by shanta Duffy behind me um if you listen to his voice, and there's lots of recordings on YouTube, you know, he, he manifests an incredible level of anger, the anger of being an abused child, the anger of being homeless, the anger then of having an HIV diagnosis and losing losing his friends. Um, and this rage sort of spills out of him. And at the same time, I think, you know, he, he does have a reparative impulse in his work, and he is somebody who made very beautiful and tender work as well. It's really interesting thinking of what work there exists right now that is motivated by that, because it isn't just the political situation, it isn't just the pandemic that we're in now, it's also climate change. You know, this, this horrifying apocalypse is approaching, and I think it's been hard for people to, amidst the glossiness of late capitalism, summon that level of clear anger. Um, I think Anne Boyer's book about cancer had some real rage in it and expressed incredibly beautifully as well. It's a wonderful book, The Undying. Um, my friend Richard Porter runs a press. He'd been doing queer anthologies. There was loneliness, there was joy, and one of those was rage. And it was really interesting how powerful it felt to just sort of handle this book that contained anger because it does feel like... Um, you know, it's almost an unfashionable emotion. In a way, emotion itself is unfashionable, but melancholy and anxiety are sort of permitted. Rage and joy feel much hotter to handle. So I think that's part of it. But how can we not be full of rage right now? We are in such an appalling moment. I feel rage listening to the British Prime Minister. I'm sure Americans are feeling rage for their own reasons. Um, you know, this is this is frightening and appalling and to see the most vulnerable put on the front line is horrendous it's a horrendous situation yeah it's interesting though isn't it that um one of the great differences between the aids crisis i i think and what we're living through now is that in the aids crisis 
you know, I was a member of ACT UP, for example, you felt in the midst of just horrendous death surrounding mm -hmm. you, death of so many artists you admired, you did yeah. feel a sense of community. You felt the ability to act. You yeah. felt a part of something. Um, and now I feel that people in this pandemic are feeling such such isolation and such acute loneliness. And you've written so well about this issue of loneliness. And I, I wonder how you think that very different experience um, will affect what comes out of this is, or is affecting how people are thinking and feeling about the efficacy of, of art. Yeah, but also the efficacy, it's interesting thinking about ACT UP now, the, the direct action group, because all of the old models of how we used to build solidarity, create resistance, they're physical, they're about bodies on the streets, they're about people getting together and talking in small rooms and planning things. And we're going to have to be very creative in how we think now, because this is going to be the model for a long time, people talking to each other on computer screens. I think it's amazing how quickly people have adapted you know heartening and amazing and at the same time it is a very different way of having conversations and different things happen when people's bodies are together in a space i think different possibilities arise when people are physically together so we we're in a very difficult space now i've forgotten the second part of the question <laughs> well i mean how how does that sense of loneliness and isolation yeah. that's to how we receive art, how we yeah. respond to it, and also how we make it. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I, you know, I wrote a book about loneliness from a period of private loneliness, and I speculated in that book that loneliness creates a kind of receptivity, a kind of openness where art becomes hugely meaningful. We cannot touch. Art is the object that passes between us. Art is a way that we can encounter other people's feelings, their thoughts, with physical separation and with the separation of time. We can encounter something from hundreds of years ago. And now we are all flung into this international global experiment in loneliness against our will, a non-consensual experiment, but here we are. And I think already it is becoming so plain to me that art matters hugely to people. Art is, art is a lifeline for people people in particular who are in lockdown alone, but just generally, here is something that allows you to feel your feelings in a way that is non-isolatory. You can listen to music and it can almost accompany you in states of loneliness or sadness. You can read, you can lose yourself in other worlds, but you can be accompanied. I think that that word seems very important to me. Art is hospitable to the stranger. It's there all the time waiting. And new art is being made out of this moment, but also old art, ancient art, suddenly reemerges anew because the way that we're looking at it is different. I can't count the amount of people who've sent me Hopper paintings since this particular crisis started saying, hey, doesn't this look different now? And it does suddenly that sense of being behind glass feels, looking out at empty streets, feels completely different to how it looked when I might have been feeling a bit lonely, but in a very popular city like New York. Mm -hmm. You know, in New York, I, I, I assume they do this where you are as well, at seven o'clock in the evening, everyone goes out on their porch or leans out their window and they um, applaud here, the uh, healthcare workers. And yeah. in where I'm living now, the windows to the street don't open. There are these huge old windows and they don't open. So I stand behind the glass oh. <laughs> silently. I can't hear them. I watch them applauding. And it, for me, that's become a kind of metaphor for what's going on in, in my yeah. life and in the world. But it also, I think, means, it, it really points up for me how much reading and for me music and reading have been a connector for me. I feel when I read that I'm alone in the room with that person, with you or with Shakespeare. And I'm terribly not being able to go to galleries and to see art, 
which in, has the same function, I think, for people of that intimate connection between yeah. viewer, reader, listener, and and the person making the work. Um, and while I see there are 1,068 people registered for this event, I wonder if something a little bit is lost in the intimacy of the connection. Are we all behind glass, you know? And and how do we pierce the glass? How do artists pierce the glass more effectively? Now, is it a different kind of challenge? It's absolutely a different kind of challenge, but at the same time, it, it doesn't require very much. It, it, all it requires is a level of imagination. I mean, I can read a little number at the bottom that says some a number, 1070, and some little icons. But at the same time, I know, I know as a person who's feeling scared a lot of the time and alone a lot of the time, that those people, you, who I'm talking to, are bodies around the world who are with their own set and their own repertoire of feelings. And I think, you know, we haven't lost our ability to do that because we're in a particular situation. That That is part of what being human is the capacity to imagine our way into other people's worlds and realities in, in the same way that I might not be talking to my neighbours, but I can see them and I can think, oh, I haven't seen Alison for a few days. I hope she's OK. Run through a few scenarios. I mean, we're, we're all doing that absolutely constantly. So I feel like um, the situation we're in is is awful, but at the same time, the qualities it's calling on us to manifest, to display, are things that are to do with kindness, to do with solidarity, to do with mutual aid. All, all of those old-fashioned socialist qualities are very necessary now. And we're seeing that the societies that are capable of doing them are doing a hell of a lot better than the societies, I'm sorry to say England and America, that cannot do them, refuse to do them, and are saying the thing that matters most is the economy. Of course, economy matters. Of course, jobs matter. But at the same time, there are other things that matter. And those things are people's lives, people's health, and the level of fear that people are living in. It seems to me, I mean, it's so funny when people act as if art is this rarefied realm. It's not. It's how we exist as people. It's how we are capable of using the tools of imagination, empathy, thoughtfulness, ingenuity all of those things are rooted in art making mm -hmm. and ordering our lives i think and um one of the things that i noticed that comes from this is in isolation um there seems to be in general um a sense of attention a sense of attention to the moment attention to the everyday attention to things um whether it's a garden or what you're cooking for dinner or how bread rises or you see this so much on social media and you talk about it with your friends and that kind of attention, that kind of careful attention is also the key moment um, that is necessary um, in the relationship between artist, art, art maker and person viewing or um, appreciating the art, that sense of attention. So do you feel that that's changed at all? That's a really interesting question. I think one of the things that seems to me sort of, I kind of hate the word healing, but healing or, or a virtue of art generally is what it does to time, that you can lose yourself, not just making art, but you're absorbed into what you're paying attention to. You're absorbed into the painting, it stops time for you, you're brought into a different sense of time. And Derek Jarman writes about this very beautifully in terms of gardening, that the garden exists outside of time. I think that's true of reading too, you, you fall out of time, you're caught up in this other world. And we're in a strange experience where I think that is happening to people a lot, that you find that you're very absorbed in a small class, we're less stimulated perhaps than we were, we're seeing fewer people, far, far, far fewer people. Um, so there's a capacity for absorption, but that is something that we ordinarily, and from a very small age, you see it with very small children, how, you know, the word's almost bewitched. You see children become bewitched by a story or bewitched by a picture, and that capacity doesn't leave us, and it's hugely sustaining and reassuring. I've found, 
you know, I ha I've sometimes been too anxious to read at all. And I really want to make it clear that I'm not expecting everybody to kind of have intense encounters with great works of art because well, some of the time we can't, it's too frightening. But when I have read, I've noticed that I've been reading with a depth of absorption that I remember from childhood, that sense of just falling very deeply. And sometimes I have been reading children's books too, which might be part of it. But having that capacity to sort of lose myself in contemplation, and it's happened sometimes outdoors as well, just gazing and gazing at something. It feels almost like recovering um, a sense that I felt I'd lost, that when I was spending so much time on the internet and was so hyper stimulated and so anxious, it seemed like I'd lost the ability to concentrate altogether. And now it has certainly come back. And perhaps that's one odd stray side effect of the particular conditions we're in now. Yeah, I was very struck by your sense of uh, Twitter as a uh, paranoid reading. <laughs> and um... Yeah, and moving away from that creates a different kind of relationship to text. Yeah. Choosing, I, choosing not to dwell in that kind of, I mean, it's so interesting reading that bit about paranoid reading now because it's so much more true now. Of course, we want to know what's happening. But at the same time, we're in a situation where there isn't an answer yet. There isn't more information. There are slight tweaks to it each day, but I'm going on and I'm looking for something that won't arise for six months and I know it won't so why am I there I'm feeding a sort of fear and I can choose not to do that and that is a choice I think it's really important we remember that it's a choice each time we do it mm -hmm. I was so struck by the section and its positioning in the book this of uh, love letters and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that chapter and those love letters and how they arose and and what they meant to you and why you place them toward the end of the book. I think um, they felt really important to me. If, you know, there are profiles at the beginning of the book and they're fairly, you know, they're, they're thorough. They're thorough pieces of writing. But I'd written other kinds of writing over the years that were much more um, heartfelt, maybe sort of tonally uh, playful or several of them were written as obituaries so they were mourning but they were also um kind of spontaneous they had a spontaneous feel to them I'd often written them quite fast and I want that to be part of criticism and it generally isn't you're not supposed to say I love these people I love this work this work David Bowie for example has sustained me throughout my life has excited me throughout my life and that is the base at which I'm speaking. I can say other things about what aesthetically is happening. I can say things about how that person's existed culturally in the world, but the root of what I'm trying to convey is love. And how can you have an art criticism that doesn't involve love? I, I, it seems absurd to me. That's that's where I'm coming from. Love is where I'm coming from, especially in this book, after writing something like Crudo that was so much about anxiety and fear. I wanted this book to exist as an antidote. I wanted it to be something people could pick up in times of unhappiness, despair, unease, and find lives that excited them, that gave them a sense of possibilities, that gave them a sense of you don't have to just accept everything as it is. You can create something utterly different at any point. You can choose to do that. The conditions might be very, very hard. It might be almost impossible, but you can choose. You can always choose. And that felt crucial to me. It felt like something I wanted to have and it felt like something I wanted to give. I, you know, I'm intrigued too by the thread of, I, I'm grasping at it actually, the thread of hope that runs through this book. <laughs> when we, when um, in February at the Center for Fiction, we were very excited about planning for um, an environmental site specific project that would happen around our borough um, with the uh, wonderful writer Emily Rabato. And we were thinking very much of how we could be activists on climate change issues and work with writers to do that. A few weeks later, we were all in lockdown. And um, so it seems that the issues that 
are, were so pressing a few months ago, are still there. They're still pressing. They're still, you know, we still have this president. You have your prime minister. Um, we still have this environmental crisis. And then we are overlaying this pandemic on the top of that and this new way of functioning in the world. So give me some hope, Olivia. <laughs> what, what exactly? Um, but I mean, what are the ways to proceed in your opinion as artists and as people who are readers, lookers? Yeah. Readers? Well, you know, it, I was an environmental activist in my 20s. I was living in trees trying to stop roads in the early 90s, mid 90s. So I have been face to face with despair about climate change for a very, very, very long time now. And I am not without hope. I'm really not. And th that's the strange thing about this pandemic is if you have been working to stop climate change, you have been told over and over and over again, these kind of changes aren't possible. We can't make these kind of changes. Capitalism is an impossible machine to stop. You can't do that. You can't stop flights. None of that is going to be able to happen. You know, we see it with the Paris Agreement. People were finding it so hard to commit to. And what has happened here is that the entire world overnight has drastically changed. So I think the one thing that I feel like is a tiny seed of hope is those kind of changes are possible. How people live their lives can become absolutely different pretty much overnight. So there is a way in which we can push to pivot from this into, OK, now we have to deal with climate change. We have to. This is nothing compared to what's coming. And we have got to change our lives. And the fact that there are not aeroplanes going over our houses is part of that. So I feel like things are really bad. Things are really frightening. And at the same time, we don't have any choices. We have to change. There's no question about it. So let's change. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should all be heartened by the fact that in, in London, in San Francisco, in New York City, in Hong Kong, we're all breathing cleaner air at the moment. We're breathing yeah. cleaner air and animals are moving into city. I mean, humans backing off a bit has made huge differences to the rest of the planet. So that does, without minimizing in any way the things that are happening to people's lives, that does give me a seed of hope. I think we should take a few questions from the audience. And so I will click on that. Ah, so. Um, this is um, when you start developing a project, do you ha already have in mind what sort of shape it will take early on? Or do you prefer not to plan and allow for your eyes, ideas and your expectations to change as you go along in the writing process? Oh, good question. Um, I kind of have a dream of a book. I generally have a title and a sense of what it is I'm trying to investigate um, pretty early on. And then it's a slow process acquiring the cast, auditioning my cast it takes sometimes years. Um, you know, my nonfiction books need a set of people who various qualities have to be there. They have to have a good archive or there has to be lots of information that I can use. Um, I need them to be able to speak in their own voices. Ideally, I want to have places that I can go and visit. I need them to have some sort of intersection in their lives. Um, and then there just has to be the sort of right feeling. So, for example, with The Lonely City, Andy Warhol only entered the picture really quite late on. Um, with my new book, I knew some of the people who I was going to have in it. But, for example, I didn't know Malcolm X was going to be in it. Um, I wasn't aware that James Baldwin was going to be in it. So people start emerging. I, I noticed that somebody appears in a footnote and then they appear in somebody else's footnote and gradually they sort of come up. So, yeah, that's the process. It's slow. Here's another question um, from Tobias Borns. And uh, I'd love the answer to this since I so admire your garden. Um, um, it says, um, it asks about the process you use to garden and create a garden. And is it similar to the process that you use to uh, make art, to write a book? Are these yeah. similar 
processes and, and what in these processes do you value? I think they are similar. I think about this loads and I think my next book actually is going to be about gardens um, because um, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I'm completely obsessed. Yeah, um, yeah you, you plan and you design, but at the same time, you're working all the time with reality. You don't have the best conditions here and this plant doesn't like it and you need to move things around and an experiment fails catastrophically, um, but something else completely unexpected arises. And the, you're always working on two levels. You're working on a sort of grand level of what the overall thing looks like, but actually most of your real labour is minute. You're, you're fiddling with things. You're weeding a little bit here and you're cutting something back a little bit there. And it, it always feels to me very much like a more pleasurable version of what it's much more enjoyable. Maybe I'll become a garden designer instead. Here's one from Rebecca Giggs who asked, Olivia, is there a specific painting or artwork that for you captures the mood of this moment, this time in quarantine, or that you turn to now? That's really interesting. I mean, the first thing I picked up was Virginia Woolf's diaries and Virginia Woolf is a real maybe that question meant painting but I'm, I'll say what was true which is and um, Virginia Woolf has been such a touchstone for me throughout my life she's she's a writer that I'm always interested in and when lockdown started I went to the final um volume of the diaries which starts around the time that war began in Britain that Britain entered the war and it was so interesting to read, you know, um, all of the sort of parallels. The post had slowed down. There was rationing. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't much petrol. This sense of her life constricting. And there were floods in Rodmell in Sussex where she was living. So that where she lived had become physically an island, but she, a strong sense of being islanded as well. And um, the blackout, bombing raids, this, this sense of being very frightened. And that sounds like a really gloomy thing to be reading, but it crackles with excitement, that book. She's so curious. She's so interested in trying to log the new strangeness in which she finds herself. It's such an artist's book in that she's always sifting through the world. She's looking for material. She's trying to understand. She's trying to get a hold on new circumstance. And in a way it's almost as if no, it's not that no situation can be too bad, but until the very last moment, and we all know how the diary ends, until the very last moment, it's still fizzing with possibilities. She's still making jokes. She's still laughing about the horrible dinner that she has to cook during rationing. So that book is absolutely what I turn to. And in some ways I found the reassuring presence of, of a writer that I love very much. And in some ways, it felt totally new to me because I'd never read it in such frightening circumstances myself. And that's the thing about art. You can return and return and, you know, there it is, familiar and completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, Here's one from Nick, which is interesting. Recently, I've noticed powerful political works of graffiti on the streets of East London as a response to the pandemic. It has prompted me to think about the cultural value of art in terms of high versus low art, mm -hmm. as well as the role of accessibility of creativity in a broader sense. Do you think the pandemic will affect how we value and or how we consume art? I wonder, I wonder. I hope that um, elements of the art world don't come back. I hope that that sort of art world that is constantly flying from art fair to art fair dies death personally, because I dislike it. And I think it's environmentally horrendous. Um, I think what we were talking about earlier sort of speaks to this, that that sense of attentiveness and that sense that, you know, I don't know if they have this in America, but in England, people are drawing rainbows. Children are drawing rainbows and putting them in their windows. And I saw today that the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum, have already put a call out to collect them because they see them as this sort of cultural artifact and this sense that people are making things to sustain other people in this very um, physical sort of crude but 
amateurish, playful way. That that feels exciting to me. That kind of art making, which perhaps we'd categorize as low, feels good to me. I'm I'm not in any way saying high art is the only kind of art to be interested in. I'm always excited by low art. I'm always excited by what people are doing on the internet and how resourceful people are. I saw an exhibition today that's called um, an exhibition for chickens that's got lots of quite well-known artists and it's been hung around sort of chicken run so the only people who can see it are chickens. <laughs> Isn't that really it. Great. Here's one from Carly and Tom de Grunwald also thinks it's a great question. Olivia, can you talk about how you see the role of the reader in response to literature that is written in crisis? Does the reader have a responsibility to take this rage forward or respond? I'm thinking particularly about when art reflects the contemporary moment so closely, as in your novel and in, as in the work of Ali Smith. Huh, that's a good question. I, I'm always talking about duties of artists in this very pious way, but I don't think the reader has duties. I think the reader is free. I think the reader can choose to be entertained, to never think about it again, or to take on absolutely the sort of message that they've picked up about social responsibility and go somewhere with it. I think that's the point about art. You, like I said right at the beginning, it's work, it's a choice. It's not going to do something to you. It's not going to change the world in those ways. And I think that this is where the accusation of people who think art can change things being naive comes from. It doesn't do it on its own. It's always a choice on the part of the reader or the viewer of where they want to go with that. Perhaps they want to resist it. Perhaps they want to hate it. Fine. That's not that's not a problem to me. Perhaps they want to use it as seeds to build a new reality. OK, that sounds great to me too. I think the worst, most toxic thing is the idea of prescriptive readings of art. And I think that's where you start getting somewhere really quite sinister. Let's stay far away from that. Let's let's allow the person to pick up the object and go where they will. That, that feels best to me. Here's one from Susan. Um, would you say that the various crises around gender including ongoing gender inequality, as well as treatment of people who are trans, are also emergencies? Are they on the scale ah! of oh! <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, yes, I think that is absolutely true. And um, expect much more from me on this topic in the book that I've just finished, which is called Everybody, and it's about bodies and thinks a lot about gender and sexuality. Um, yeah, I think that is an ongoing emergency that's been an emergency for what, like two millennia now? <laughs> yeah, so there's a second part of that question that says, if so, does the art produced by folks who are queer or women, trans, function similarly or differently in the context of these long-standing emergencies? Hmm. I mean, that is a very large category because the art of women, people who are queer and trans is an awful lot of art and it's doing lots and lots of different things. But I think um, some people are making art in those contexts out of a campaigning impulse and some people aren't. And those those choices are free. But I mean, pretty much every artist I've written about in this book is either queer or a woman. I don't think very many straight men I'm just ticking through, there might be one or two, but so when I'm talking about emergency, and I think I can only really speak for myself here, that is part of the emergency that I am always talking about. The emergency of gender and sexuality is always part of it, what it means to have divergent sexuality or divergent gender, or to be subject to oppression in the society that you find yourself is absolutely what Funny Weather is about. So we have time for one more question. And let me see. Um, um, here's one. Um, do you have any advice for those who want to create art or focus on their creative work and may now be facing increasing imperatives to do other kinds of work um, given the crisis we're all living through? Yes. 
I think um, you have to make what you want to make. You have to. And at the same time, it isn't necessarily going to be something that you can expect to make a living from right now. I think that isn't to say that I don't think art is something that should be paid for and that people should be able to make a living from. But I think that if you can't make a living from it in the current situation, that doesn't mean you should stop. Again, that might be an unfashionable answer, but I think from the bottom of me, that feels that feels true that you have to make things. If you need to make things, you have to do that. And we all have to contribute to make a world and to maintain a world where that is also a financially viable life. And that is on absolutely everybody who's listening. We all have to support our art institutions. We have to support our bookstores. We have to create at the end of this, a fertile, thriving world in which the artist can survive. That's that's all I can say to that, I think. Oh, look, a little thing's popped up on my screen saying, give $10 to support the Centre of the <laughs> Defense. That was very appropriate timing. Very funny. Um, <laughs> that seems to me a perfect note to end on. Um, I want to thank you, Olivia, um, for this book, for doing this today, for all your books, the profound impact they have on me and for uh, on so many readers, especially these 1,089 people who have joined us today. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart and thank all of you for tuning in. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you so much. I mean, thank you, Noreen and Melanie, Center for Fiction, but all of you people, it, it's so moving to just be like sitting on my chair in my house in Cambridge and to feel like people are around the world listening. So thank you so, so much.